Barry Costello. I'm co-president of the League of Women Voters of Athens County with Adrian Mullenkamp. And we are very glad to see you here for this evening's town hall meeting. Um, we've invited uh, Superintendent Tom Gibbs and board member Tom Parsons and board vice president Kim Goldsberry to this town hall meeting to answer your questions about the Athens City School District income tax or tax levy that will be on the November ballot. Uh, before we start, I'd like to thank uh, the Community Center for letting us use this space, which we really appreciate. And I'd like to thank the Government Channel, who is here uh, recording this event. It's live streamed tonight on Facebook and will be on the Government It'll be on the government channel tomorrow and on the city's YouTube and Facebook pages on demand, and it will be uh, running on the government channel as well, and the city's web page. There will be multiple opportunities to review this evening's information. I'd also like to thank the media. We have someone from the Athens News, thank you for being here, and someone from WOUP, and they will be able to ask questions as well as you. Oh, excellent. Well, glad, glad you're here. Thank you for coming. It really is helpful to have the media here because uh, the information that is shared here, um, you know, can go a lot farther than the media reports it. So we're very happy to have that, to have this here. Um, as many of you know, the League of Women Voters uh, is dedicated to providing opportunities for voters to learn about candidates and issues. So informed decisions can be made at the poll, at the polls. And we do this through our candidate forums, our town halls, through printing our voter guides and uh, registering voters, which is another thing that we do. Uh, we were out in force today because today is National Voter Registration Day. And by the way, if any of you have, have a need to register or to register with a new name or a new address, See me afterwards and see that that is done tonight. Um, so on the back table is some literature that uh, we would want you to know about and that we would take. Primary among the literature pieces is a postcard that is dense with information. Across the top of it, it says vote411.org. That is an electronic voter guide. And if you go to vote411.org, type in your address, you can come to a page where you see all of the candidates, and we'll have the Athens County candidates and the statewide candidates on that website. Um, you can see the candidates' answers to questions posed by the legal voters. Also on this card down in the middle is another website that is very valuable. It is judicialvotescount.org. There are four judicial races on our ballot this fall. And often we go to the polls and say, who are these people? We've never heard of them. Judicialvotescount.org is a website that is developed by the state league in partnership with some other organizations so that um, we can have some information about the judicial candidates. So their answers to be Posed questions are at judicialvotescamp.org. So please take one of these, and there's lots more information on there to look at. Um, in addition, we will have some other forums coming up. There's a sheet back there that lists them. So if you're interested in attending any other forums, please take this. And finally, if you have any interest in sharing in the work of the
And that's where you kind of jump ahead in, in your number and do some of the work ahead of time and then get credit for that money you spent later on. It's important to note that Athens did an expedited local partnership program in between years 99 and 2001 where they, they invested uh, uh, several million dollars into primarily Athens Middle School, a little bit of money in, in Athens High School. You'll see some credit for that work later on in this. Uh, in this. Um, I'm going to move pretty quickly. I did this the other night, be over 20 minutes, and I only have 15, so my apologies if I seem rushed. Uh, the way this works is, School Facilities Division sends in a group of architects and engineers to come in, and they review every major system in a school building. And literally, your HVAC, your plumbing, your electric, your roofs, the building envelope, uh, including windows, masonry, uh, foundations, everything. They go through and they make a judgment as to the quality and state of repair and the existing life term on all of those different systems. And they calculate what needs to be replaced, fully replaced, what can be renovated, and they do a calculation. When they came through our school buildings, what they're seeing is, they're seeing things like outdated and failing HVAC electrical and plumbing systems. Keep in mind, some of our buildings, more and more known by people, a lot of people out of that building, it looks nice from the outside. It has the original HVAC system that was put in place in 1979. Now, obviously, it's outlived its, its life expectancy, uh, and we're still plugging along. Uh, but that system was designed at a time, and that building was designed at a time, when uh, our energy issues in the country were a little bit different. So there's not a lot of windows. The windows uh, uh, don't open generally, or if they do, don't allow a lot of uh, uh, natural airflow. That HVAC system is actually a heat pump system, which means there's no um, significant outside air exchange, which means when our kids are sitting in those classrooms, they're sitting in those classrooms and there's not a good exchange of fresh air in and out of those rooms. So when you start to think about a facility like that that was designed at a different time, different standards, and then what we expect today, um, when the OFCC looks at that system, they're saying that needs to be completely replaced and that type of system is no longer acceptable because it doesn't provide the air quality and the environment that we want our students to be learning in. So when you start to take individual circumstances like that in each building, so Athens High School has rooftop HVAC units, that many of those were outdated. When that building was built, it was built as an open classroom format. Since then, they've installed, this happened before my time, installed partition walls between every classroom all the way up to the ceiling. The HVAC was not re-engineered. They kept the original HVAC arrangement, which means that we have a, a classroom situation at Athens High School that has almost no natural light in many classrooms that has an HVAC system that was not designed for the space and therefore does not give us again the airflow, the, the comfort in the classroom, uh, things of that nature that we would expect in a, in a modern school facility. When you start to add up the price tag of replacing original electrical systems that were designed prior to the, the advent of computers, I mean, think about that. Athens High School, the, the overwhelming majority of that building has the original electrical system that was installed in 1967 uh, prior to, to us using uh, no computing devices at all. Um, start adding up the cost of replacing the plumbing system, HVAC system, roofs, uh, electrical systems for a building that size, and you get into millions and millions of dollars. Um, other, right, other things we have challenges with, we've got the next slide, building envelopes, including windows, things, uh, windows, roofs. Uh, you can see here a couple examples of water infiltration. Um, with the picture to the left, that type of water infiltration isn't necessarily just a roof leak. Oftentimes that will happen in old buildings where you're starting to have breakdowns in masonry where it needs resealed or uh, tough pointed and redone. Um, these, are, these are costly endeavors, but when you start to add up these figures, they, they get into very large sums of money. So what the state does is they'll calculate that cost for the building. You got it, Sean. They calculate that cost for the building, and they take into account um, what the cost for each one of those systems are, and they do a comparison of, if we were to fix everything in this school building, what would that cost? And then if we were to build 
build a brand new building to serve the same number of students, what would that cost? And they do a mathematical ratio of those two numbers. And if it's more than two-thirds, it's called the two-thirds rule, then the state would recommend that you build a new building. The point being is, is that when you get into renovating an old uh, uh, building to the extent that it's more than two-thirds of the cost or two-thirds of the cost or more, then you start to run into other problems with elevation costs pretty quickly. Also, uh, new buildings generally have longer life expectancies overall. Um, so they want to make sure that, that every, uh, every building, every school district in the state is at a certain standard. So when they came through and did the assessments of our buildings, at Athens High School, it was over the two-thirds rule, so they would recommend to build new. Athens Middle School was under the two-thirds rule only because of all of the money invested in 99-2000, so it's slated to renovate. The Plains Elementary School is our newest building. It's under the two-thirds rule, so it would be a reno. Uh, West Elementary School is well over the two-thirds rule, so it would, uh, it would be a build new. Uh, however, that location is currently not included in the proposed plan. Uh, Morris North Elementary School is over the two-thirds rule, and East Elementary School is over the two-thirds rule. And so then, after looking at all of this information, and then the board had a, uh, uh, appointed a steering committee at community conversations, multiple public meetings over the course of an 18 month to two, two year period of time, uh, the board came up with, um, you know, got to the point where it's time to put this before the voters and see if the voters would, would uh, help fund a project. So what the facilities master plan was, was approved by the Board of Education earlier this spring is to replace Athens High School with a new building on the same property to renovate Athens Middle School and continue to use it as a grade seven and eight school building. To build a new building on the current site of East Elementary School, uh, but to have it serve students in grades pre-K, uh, pre-kindergarten and third grade. Uh, to build a new building on the Morris and Norton Elementary site uh, to serve students in preschool through third grade. And then to do a renovation and an addition to the Plains Elementary School uh, to serve as an intermediate school for the district for the cities. And so when they calculate the cost to do all that work, I mean, it's a pretty big number, uh, about $86 million. Um, now, the next number down, you'll see a deduct of about $7 million. That is for that health work that I referred to early in the presentation, the work that was completed at Athens Middle School in uh, the 99-2001 time period. And then you'll see a big deduct of $27.5 million, which is what the state will provide to us, uh, tax money back to our school district in order to help fund this project, which leaves us with the base cost being $51.5 million uh, for the base cost of that project. Now, one of the challenges with this, though, is you can never predict what interest rates are going to be when you have sell bonds. You can never predict what inflation is going to be in construction. And there are also some things the state won't fund. So one of the things the state won't fund is uh, fixing the auditorium. And so in the board, in their public meetings, conversations, came to the conclusion that if we were going to build a new high school, that, it's, that our, our community, the arts are important to our community, and the need to have a fixed seat auditorium in the our community, and so they wanted to add additional dollars in for that. Uh, there's also some additional money to ensure that the high school gymnasium is at least the same size as the current gymnasium, and uh, some additional dollars to pay to replace the tennis courts at Adams High School, which are in uh, very great need for, uh, for repair, actually replacement. So when you uh, calculate the, the what are called locally funded initiatives, you get a total price tag of 60 0.5 million dollars. And uh, so what's that mean to the individual taxpayer? So, uh, well, I guess going back here, Sean, next one. Yeah, so what do we get if we approve this? Uh, the first thing we get is over 27 million dollars back from uh, the state government. And I want to remind everyone, that's 27 million dollars in the state taxes that we've already paid. And that if we don't collect on that $27 million, another school district is going to get that money. And so we have an opportunity to have the state reinvest $27.5 million of, of tax money back into our community, back into our school district. And so that's something that we would gain if, if, if voters did approve this. Next slide. Um, in addition, you know, I talked about kind of what's wrong with our current buildings. But 
but you really can't look at it that way. You have to look at it also as in by and large these are brand new school buildings. So you're talking about buildings that have improved security. Right now, if you visit each elementary school, the office is on the second floor. We have a buzz-in system that you can buzz in and literally walk right into a kindergarten classroom before you ever get close to the office. Same thing at, well, Athens High School. There's an office right inside the door. You don't have to go through the office to access the building. You can buzz in, and if you want to run right by the office, you have full access to our student body, and no one's going to stop you. So we have improved security. We have modern learning environments. We have much more natural lighting. That is paid much more attention to now than what it was at the time when these buildings were built. Greater energy efficiency, um, and there's a couple of folks in the community I talked to about the ideas of, of, of trying to include things like solar and looking at how do we reduce our energy costs and so save, save more money operationally. Um, new community space. I don't think we uh, can, I think we sometimes forget. Last Thursday we had a board meeting. At Athens High School that one night, we had a volleyball game, a soccer game, the football team was eating in the cafeteria, the flag corps was practicing the auditorium right before we started board meeting there, and youth cheerleading was in the, uh, in the atrium. Our buildings get used as much or more than this building as community centers for our community. We have youth basketball leagues to play there. Uh, we have, you know, we often host meetings for outside groups, Boy Scouts, Girl Scouts, uh, things of that nature. So we're going to have new community spaces, and in many instances, those community spaces are larger than the ones we have now. So the elementary gyms at East and Morris and Gordon would be significantly larger than the ones that are there now, which would open up more opportunity for community use of buildings. Updated in technology infrastructure. We've tried to retrofit our buildings for technology, uh, but you get you get to a point where you have so many wires hanging around, and even with wireless. Uh, is you have to run wires to those wireless hubs. Um, the, the technology infrastructure would be substantial. And then the other thing is just uh, when you build a new building in the state of Ohio, uh, they make sure that every every desk, every piece of furniture in the building is brand new. So literally, uh, your, your children are going to walk into a, a brand new uh, building, brand new facility, brand new, uh, brand new furnishings. So, Obvious question, Brad, what's the cost of the Okay, so um, this is how you calculate your, your tax bill. Most of you probably already know this, just in case you don't. Uh, firstly, it's based on the county auditor's valuation of your property. And that's important because it's not necessarily if you recently bought your house, the county auditor's valuation may be lower than your house. Uh, if, if, if you just if you've owned your house for a long time, it may be undervalued by the county auditor. So you really have to look at your tax to see what the county auditor has your house appraised for. Then you need to take that number, and we only pay tax on 35% of the appraised value. So if I own a house that's valued by the county auditor at $100,000, I'm only paying tax on $35,000. So then you uh, multiply by the, uh, by the millage rate, which is 5.88 mills, you multiply by 0 0.00588, and you would find out that on $100,000 worth of value, you're going to pay about $206 a year in increased property tax. Now, obviously, if you have a house valued at $50,000, if you have that, and you have a house valued at $200,000, your, your tax increase is going to be twice that. Um, it, it is important to note that if you are uh, of over age 65, uh, disabled, and meet certain income requirements, that you may be eligible for a, a deduct in your uh, property tax, and uh, I would encourage you to contact the county auditor's office if, if, you, uh, if you meet those qualifications or think you meet those qualifications. So, um, in addition to bond levy itself, every project like this required by the State Department of Education, by the, the OFCC rather, to have a half mill permit improvement levy. Uh, that money that just gets socked away so that when things do start to go wrong in the building, uh, you have money to replace and repair. Um, that has to be collected 23 of the 30 years, and uh, it is the intent of the board to uh, to wait until after the current bond issue for Athens Middle School goes off the uh, collections before they start to collect that half mill, so that it really wouldn't be noticeable to the average taxpayer. And last point is, uh, last at the uh, August meeting, the Board of Education passed a resolution that said in the first year, the board only intends to collect three mills of property tax, not the full 5.88. 
So that we can ease into that. Once we sell bonds, we'll know what we need to fix the rate at. But we can review it every year and adjust that rate based on what's actually needed to pay the bonds, not on the full 5.8. I'm being told time's up. Thank you. Do you want to say that that's on our website? Is that on our website? It's, uh, yeah, this is not on our website yet, but it will be. Um, I added a couple slides since Thursday, so I wanted to make sure I had the most updated version of that. Thank you very much. Yeah. I would like to ask from the ODU. Yes. Uh, okay. Okay, so I'm obviously. Not a parent. I don't have a child that goes to any Athens uh, city school. I'm actually a student here myself at OU. But I have talked to some parents that I do know of in the community, and I guess just one concern that they have that I've heard is that um, perhaps the past three or four years, certain things throughout the schools have been thin or not taken care of. Um, just small things like walls that we painted. Um, possible like windows that could be easily fixed, um, and they're saying that it was purposely done so that this levy could pass. Um, I wonder if um, the board would want to talk about that a little bit, clear up the air um, about that quote unquote rumor of sorts. Um, this is the permanent improvement of fund expenditure history. Yes. Oh, thank you. We were told we had to turn this microphone off for that one to work, so sorry. Um, thanks for the question. Um, this, uh, I think there's a couple sides to it. One is a painting, you know, that sort of thing. Those are small kind of uh, issues in the buildings. Um, we're these, what we're talking about are very large, uh, challenging issues, foundations, systems, uh, like Tom Gibbs was saying, heating and cooling, all that stuff. So those are much bigger. Um, the fact that the Morrison Gordon uh, heating and cooling system is still functioning is, in my opinion, a testament to the maintenance that our staff has put into it. A lot of people don't know, but we can't really get those heat pumps anymore. And so we bought them what, from Pickerington. So Pickerington schools, they, they did their building project, and the district a number of years ago bought those systems, and they're sitting in a warehouse, and as ours die, we grab one of those and we swap it out. That's I mean, kind of trying to be proactive with it. Um, we have uh, a permanent improvement fund that has been, that money has been spent every single year on permanent improvements. And that includes a lot of things. Generally, it can be anything that is, um, is five years, uh, that, that has a life longer than five years, or five years or more, but it does include roofs and paving and uh, school furniture and technology and all these things. But there's a point that where it's, it's very difficult to keep up. And if we're looking at, I think, the projection that um, from Matt Bunting was by 2021, if we continue to spend, as we are right now, using our permanent for money, improvement money, we will be running in the red. And so we cannot continue to maintain at the level that we are, which is not, not really meeting what we need currently uh, with the funds that we have. And so we have to look long term into uh, to addressing those. Um, and it is, you know, you can see, you can see paint, you can see those things, you can see warp ceiling tiles. But again, I remind people that that's a symptom of a problem. A warp ceiling tile, it, uh, that every single one of them pretty much at the Plains Elementary, is not just replace the ceiling tiles. Yeah, I mean, I can do that in my house, but if I put that ceiling tile back up and I have a leaking tub, it's going gonna, it's gonna to soak my ceiling tile again. So that's what we have to address. It's not just those things. The other thing is we've had, we've replaced our chillers in our um, at West Elementary, uh, wasn't that 40,000? Compressors. Compressors, okay. Mm -hmm. These are very comfortable. And then the condensers um, at Athens Middle School, our water pump to get water all the way to the third floor um, went out at the beginning of the school year. We almost weren't able to open the school building. And that was $125,000. Eighty-five. Oh, the new, exactly. the new. Eighty-five thousand dollars is what we just had to purchase to keep the water flowing so that the kids can flush toilets at the middle school. So we are actively maintaining our buildings so that we can keep kids warm, safe, and dry. We did one under the kids. I just wanted to ask, um, I've heard a lot of people compare 
um, the issue of like whether or not to renovate the building compared with building new to whether or not to renovate a house. So my question is, how do these buildings, these buildings differ from how we maintain a house? And I'm wondering if there's any legal reason why these buildings might be inevitably torn down or down in the future. He wanted Part of the question. Oh, she's uh, renovating schools versus comparing homes, to comparing to. Yeah, I'm, I'm sorry, I had a little, a little trouble hearing, but I got the main part. So, comparing renovating a and, and first replacing a school building, comparing that to homes, very difficult. Most of us don't have, you know, 400 kids a day walking in and out the front door, uh, eating lunch in the cafeteria, uh, using your bathroom, um, things of that nature, and it and it does make a difference. There's just more. There's more wear and tear. Um, additionally, it's it's one thing to say, okay, in my house, I need a new HVAC system. And what we typically mean when we say that is, is I need a new uh, air conditioning unit that sits outside my house that's attached to my, my uh, forced air system inside my house, and I need to replace the furnace. What we're talking about a lot of instances are, is that we have a system, Morrison Gordon Elementary School is the best example of this, although East is a good example as well, where the, the piping at East Elementary School that goes from the boiler and the air conditioning, uh, uh, the, the cooler, throughout the building, that's all original plumbing to when that building was built. And so if you start to think about then, it's not just replacing that boiler, it's replacing all of the plumbing in between and where are you going to have to tear out walls to make that happen, where are you going to have to reconfigure the system to make that happen. At Morrison Gordon Elementary School, you can't put heat pumps back in. So there is no plumbing for a system of that nature. There is no duct work for a forced air system. And so you're literally talking about not just putting in boilers and condensers, and you're talking about putting retrofitting an existing building with every, everything across the board. And when you start to add in the costs, uh, not to mention the disruption to students. I mean, the one other thing that I think we we, we need to remind ourselves is is that our students have to, to continue to have school. And so if you're doing a complete renovation of a building of this nature, they can't be in the building while you're doing it, which means you're going to relocate them to uh, you know, modular unit, mo modular classrooms. Uh, you're going to create kind of false buildings, temporary buildings. Whereas if you're building new, there are ways that you can build a new building, say on the Morrison Gordon Elementary site behind the building at Athens High School on a different place on that site. Students continue going to the current facility, and then once the building's built, you move into the new building, and then you tear down the old building, you use that land for your parking spots, your, your, uh, your playgrounds, things of that nature. Um, Okay. And the cost, the cost of those modular buildings is astronomical. I mean, $1.5 million is what we were budgeted for, for the for modulars. And so we really have tried to think through this plan so that it is not wasting taxpayer money on using modulars for a couple years, but allowing our students to stay in buildings and have a quality education while we continue to use the of our infrastructure. By a system. Uh, the first question for the audience what additional programs and services will the school levy provide? For example, will there be more funding for students with disabilities? <laughs> But it's not what we could provide because of our limited space school relations. Um, you know, at Morris and Gordon, we have 10 classrooms that don't have a window. And quite a few of those are special education classrooms. We only have sensory rooms at um, the high school, at the Plains. And East is working on it. East is working on it. If you're a child that on the autism spectrum, we've seen the benefit of having a sensory room so that when they get overstimulated, they can go to a room and calm down. Um, this is what we need in every single one of our buildings. It, 
we need to be able to provide those children not tucked back in a corner where they are at the high school. We need to have them right there where all the other kids are so that they can be amongst their peers in the student population. At East, the only accessibility is through the elevator. You have to have a chaperone on the elevator. Um, at, at the high school, the building is so expansive, I mean, it's because it's one floor, obviously, that to get from the science hallway to the special education room, you can't make it in that time frame. You can barely make it if you're a student with two able legs to make it in the time frame. So we really need to think about how we are, we need to incorporate our students, students of all abilities in our classrooms. Another thing is when I went up to Lancaster schools and um, went through Tony's, um, Lancaster just went through new buildings and I was really impressed with the way they incorporated special education. Um, for instance, if you had a hearing impairment, the entire classroom was wired so that there were speakers for everyone, not a child with a hearing impairment that had to have headphones. So everyone could hear better because the teacher could just turn a button and it allowed everyone to be able to hear so that if one person was not singled out. And we need to think about what we can, we need, we need to do better. I don't know if you want to and, add. And, and this is a facilities levy, it's not a levy that is for curriculum. The, not, the money from this does not go to salaries, does not go to Dr. Gibbs. You can't just start writing yourself a greater check. This is specifically for buildings. Uh, but we're, these are also intentionally designed spaces for needs of all students. I believe that Tony Shore, Tony Shore, the architect, had said that uh, we'd be increasing the number of those spaces at the Plains, uh, adding more and more rooms. Um, and so uh, those are some of the efforts that we can do as we continue to be envision where our buildings may, may be able to be. Thank you. Next question. How are the new district lines to be drawn? in order to assign kids to one or another pre-K program. This is a multiple part question. How will this system turn our mic on? We turned our mic on. We did. We did. I turned it off now. How will socioeconomic segregation be prevented and what will happen with open enrollment? So I, I got handed the mic, so I guess I have to answer this. Um, firstly, keep in mind that, that if a bond issue passes in November, that we will move into buildings for potentially three, three to five years, uh, which means that the, the current location where students live may be different during that time frame. Uh, in order to draw boundaries, what we can do is, and I've actually started uh, doing some, some, uh, some uh, testing of this. We use a program called TransFinder, which is a, an automated system where we load in all of the addresses of students throughout the district. I can correlate that with our data on free reduced lunch so that I can see literally where the students that are identified as being students living in poverty are located in the district on a map and how that compares with our transportation routes. Um, when we get closer to opening dates of schools or when, you know, if, if we were fortunate enough to have uh, the funding to build new buildings and to to um, and to, to put the plan in place. Then at that point, then I would run that for real, and we would balance the population based on assuring that each of the elementaries had comparable levels of, of socioeconomic uh, status with the population of the uh, of the students in each building. Um, Did I answer the question? Free and reduced lunch. Well, this SES, the open enrollment district lines. Okay, so uh, so that's that's the the setting the district lines that kind of addresses the SES question, and and really the only measure we have to figure out SES socioeconomic status is student eligibility for free reduced lunch, and it's not a perfect measure, but it's the measure that's the the data that we have access to, and that is the data that the federal government uses to provide funding for Title One and uh, and other programming. In regards to open enrollment. Um, I can't answer that question. Um, 
there are two types of open enrollment. One's inter-district, which means students coming from outside of our district to our schools. The other is intra-district. That's between the two the, the school buildings. Uh, so essentially, intra-school district open enrollment or intra-school open enrollment would only be pre-K to three. Um, and uh, there are uh, policy measures the district can take to uh, to consider socioeconomic status and allowing students to transfer from one from one area to another. Uh, again, it's not perfect, but we believe that we can keep a decent balance. In regards to inter-district open enrollment, um, it, it it would improve. Uh, I can tell you that. In regards to, um, we actually, in my estimation, lose money on inter-district inter open enrollment because we're accepting students that require us to fill positions that if we reconfigured to where we had fewer elementary buildings, we wouldn't need to fill those positions. Um, so I would, it would be my recommendation to the board that we look closely at open enrollment and that we are more mindful of how we accept and how many students we accept moving forward. You can shut the microphone up. So oh, I shut yes. They need a bond issue. Thank you. How old is the oldest school building, and can the new buildings be built to last as long? I've got the numbers. Nineteen twenty-seven. Yeah. Um, it depends what you consider uh, East's birth date, if you will. It was on Sunnyside, and that goes way back. So part of that still is there. We had the hundredth birthday. About I don't know, six, eight years ago. <laughs> yeah, so I'm, I'm kind of, I had a couple notes here. 1938 is considered the construction of East Elementary, um, but that's the, with the, including the name change, too. Um, and we look at a place like the, the middle school that was constructed at a different time with different construction methods as opposed to what was happening in the 60s and the 70s, which buildings became disposable. Um, they built them cheaply, they didn't build them with the future necessarily in mind. Uh, labor practices were different, that's something we tried to, uh, we made that um, resolution to work with the lowest, most responsible bidder, not just the lowest bidder, as many buildings have been, have been built. Um, and part of the issue too is the, the older buildings, um, I mean we're talking about almost every building is built before the digital age. And we just talk about how incredibly fast things have changed since then. Um, and when, when we build, when we try to retrofit those buildings, it's challenging. And they were not designed to be rebuilt, to be repurposed, or to, I guess to be, you know, kind of clean them out, gut them out, and then just make everything new on the inside. But with new modern construction, where you're having steel beams uh, for, uh, for, the, for the bones of your building, you can take away and add back onto that more easily than when you start taking out load-bearing walls. So the modern construction um, is, uh, is, is something I think is, is to be considered in this, um, certainly. Um, and we look at the high school, which was meant to be one thing, and, and uh, we learn a lot of lessons from, uh, from those two. And we're also counting on the expertise of, uh, of people all throughout the state that this is their, kind of their profession. But this, is, this is kind of part that I've toyed with. Um, it's hard for me to say we should tear down a building because I'm kind of a fixer up type of person. And um, I think about the longevity of buildings. And so part of why I just drove up to Lancaster one day um, is I really wanted to see what the buildings looked like and physically walk through those buildings to see if, because I don't remember if everyone was aware, but we had this other architect that kind of came through and he lasted maybe two meetings and we let, told him that they needed to, we needed to hire somebody that was a little more suited for us because he was showing us all these great, these modern Google type of spaces, which are cool, but um, we need to build buildings that are going to last and we need to build buildings that are traditional classroom spaces, but yet have the modern touches that allow our students to um, have the abilities with technology. So as a board member, if I'm still on the board when this goes on, um, if we pass this within the next three and a half years, we will, I, I will pay attention to that because um, I do think that it's something that's really important is to be sustainably responsible. <laughs>
Does the district have the capability to operate the configuration of the zone master plan? And can you share your numbers and estimates with us? Can I clarify? Um, does the master plan meeting the new configurations of the buildings? Okay. Um, yes. Yeah, you go for it. <laughs> I have to share the microphone. I'm just going to stick to message. This election is not about the configuration of schools. This election is about the fact that our children currently attend facilities that have poor air quality, not very good natural light, are not as safe as they could be, does not have the modern technology that they need, and we need to invest money in those facilities. The bond issue that is before you on November 6th is about facilities. It's about providing clean, safe, appropriate learning spaces for our children. We've had the argument about configuration. I'm sure that will continue. The bond issue on November 6th is about facilities. And I think it's important to continuously remind folks that if that that, that is what the key issue is here that, that we're voting on in November. And the twenty-seven million from the state be used only for new buildings, or can it be used to repair and update old buildings? Well, if if we meet, um, we can go. When you go to the master plan with the, with the state, and you you meet their requirements, you will have access to their funding. Um, and part of this plan does include a renovation. renovation. It is not exclusively new building. We, if we were to renovate, we have to meet their particular their particular standards for renovation. But I think the question is, can sometimes there's people, we have conversations that why don't we just renovate kind of what we want to renovate, use our own money, go don't use the state funding, and kind of go our own route. Well, so if we take for instance East Elementary, HVAC, roof, all electric, plumbing, uh, access for people with disabilities, uh, security and abatement, that's almost four million dollars right there. And that does not give us any state assistance if we do just that. If we add in decades old furniture uh, and how far we're behind in technology, that's another $850,000. So now we're starting to creep up and keep going. And then do we want a fire suppression system? Because East doesn't have one. So that's an extra cost. And what are we going to do to work with the spaces to make them more safe? And so we start to add up all of these things and all of a sudden this renovation number is starting to push your new build number. And that's why that state has that particular formula. But if we renovate only to what we want, then as a community, we're trying to decide. We're making value judgments on what our children need. And that, that and we're, then we're looking at this whole, kind of this whole platter of things. We say, yes, we like this. Yeah, we want to have fire suppression needs. Well, that's, you know, it starts to add up and add up and add up. And that's how we kind of start getting to that decision about, um, about rebuilding. But yes, you can renovate use state funding, but you need to renovate to their standards. Um, and a renovation, once that renovation number starts looking like a new build or getting closer to it, uh, that's where that conversation started to shift into that, other, into that other direction. But if we renovate, it has to meet the state standard for renovation, and we can't just pick and choose. We could locally fund all of that if we wanted to. But like I just said, we're going to be $5 million into that before we really get started. And that's one building, not all of them. Is that right? Yep. Single campus is obviously better for socioeconomic integration and special education. Why did you budget and opt for a three elementary school plan? We put together a steering committee about two years ago, made up of teachers, union members, um, representatives from every elementary school, and they came together and they suggested a single campus. Then as, one, one, one of the three. as one of the three groups. Single campus, uh, anyway. We, then we started listening to the community. In the community, there was a backlash. There is a group that say single campus. There's a group that says we want to keep our schools in our neighborhoods. And so that's where the compromise came from, is we have listened to the community every step of the way. 
we know that we have a socioeconomic imbalance and our students are not getting the same education at every single elementary building. And it's not because of the teachers. It's because of the population. And we know we can do better. And so by listening to the community and trying to figure out how we can move forward with approval from the community, the compromise was then connect form based off of trying to meet the needs of the students and still keep neighborhood schools for the community, the small schools group, but also providing less buildings so that we can provide more services for special education and that all students can benefit from having um, students with abilities in their classrooms. It was also important, you know, right now the way our students come together at seventh grade, it's probably the hardest transitional time for adolescents. And so that was another thing we really wanted to consider is getting our kids together at a younger age so that those, um, they have more opportunities to develop peer groups. Um, so that was another thing that really drove the, um, the compromise. Is it necessary to complete the entire program package at one time, or can the project be loaded on and completed separately? Uh, so the board could have voted to put a project on what's called segments. Each segment would have to be the equivalent of 40 mils uh, worth of, of uh, valuation, which for our district is somewhere in the 20 to 25 million dollar range. So with a 90 million dollar project, you could have broken this up into to three segments. Um, I want to keep keep in mind though that um, all of our buildings today, I mean, just since school started this year, I've had HVAC failures at Athens High School, at the Plains Elementary School, and the Plains is pretty dire because the Plains has a humidity issue. And with the heat and humidity that we've had outside, your HVAC system goes down, you're going to have mold grow inside that building overnight. It just it doesn't take long at all. So I've had, we've, we've been working through HVAC failures there. We've had the domestic water pump issue at Athens Middle School. We've had HVAC issues at both West Elementary School and East Elementary School. Which building are you going to punt? and say, oh yeah, those kids, they can keep going to school in that environment for another five years while we fix up this other building. The board was concerned about equity. And equity means a lot of things and a lot of different things to different people. But I can tell you, what I want, call it whatever you like, is I want every one of our students to go to a safe, warm, dry facility where I don't have to worry day to day whether the lights are going to come on, the toilet's going to flush, or the heat's going to work. And I would hope that other folks in the community would have similar aspirations, uh, which I don't think are actually very aspirational. I think they're pretty basic. And, and also adding part of the, you know, there could be segmentation and break it down that adds more transitions for students. A big concern in the community. I mean, which ones go in which order? And then there might be times where students are displaced uh, more often than they would be with this. Um, there is the incre ever increasing cost of, cost of construction. I think that the cost to build Athens High School was like two point something million, right? So uh, it, it costs are increasing. That's what the little green booklet that you can find on the, the Athens High School said the construction cost was. Um, but we, we, the longer we wait, the more that it goes up. We are at near historic uh, interest, low interest rates. Those are going to rise too. So the longer that we wait, the greater that this project costs. So if we did segment this, then while it would reduce right now, we'd be looking at paying more in the long term. And so it was part of the reason to kind of, that was part of that conversation uh, as well. The new configuration will require a lot more busing. Why should my five-year-old in the planes have to go all the way to Athens? You're, you're on the busing. Yeah, you get the yeah. busing question on time. <laughs> Sorry. I was hoping to be able to just get to sit here and listen to them talk. Um, firstly, I, I think it's a presumption that busing would be more expensive. Uh, we currently do dual routing right now. 
uh, we have uh, significantly decreased transportation expense in the last five years. Uh, the reconfiguration doesn't necessarily require that there would be an increase in the number of buses or in, in transportation costs. Um, there are multiple ways to do that. You could go to a triple routing system, which basically means that uh, you would run the same routes three times instead of two. That would require fewer buses, fewer drivers, but those drivers would get paid for more hours per day. But, uh, buses would have more miles on them per year, per year, so it would be spending your money differently. You could continue to do dual route. Right now, we run our, after, our second dual route, actually first in the morning, uh, first dual route would be the middle school, high school dual route. All of those students are picked up at the same time on the same route. They're dropped off at one building and then shuttled to the other. You could do the same thing with the elementaries. Right now we canvass the entire district. We pick up all the elementaries and they just go directly to the one building. You could canvass the entire building, drop the ones off at one building that need to be there, go to the next building. Um, it, it, we do have excess capacity on our transportation system right now. Uh, so uh, if you take a look at the number of buses that we run, 20 regular routes, uh, 50 kids on average can fit comfortably, especially elementary kids, on a, uh, on a bus. That's about 1,000 students per route run. We run two, which means we have capacity for at least 2,000 students. We do not bus 2,000 students to and from school on a daily basis. We have 2,700 students. Almost 400 of those are out of district open enrollment. And then when you take into account the number of students who will still be able to walk to school and who will still be transported by their parents, we have sufficient transportation capacity to handle that load. It would just be a different way of transporting students than what we're doing today. require um, a separate drop-off location for buses and a separate drop-off location for parents. And so when our buildings were built, that was not necessarily the case. Now at the Athens Middle School, um, that's going to be a renovation. We'll have to get a waiver for that because there's only one street in front of that building and we drop off along the sides. But for the elementary structures, um, we actually, it'll improve the safety around the buildings. Um, I, I hear it claims that people start lining up um, well before 3.15 when their kids get out at 3.55 or 45. And I see it at West Elementary when I pick up my sons from golf practice at the high school. There are, kids, there are parents in front of that building at 3.05 um, waiting for the time frame. So, the buildings will be designed with access so you can pull off the street in front of the, those buildings or behind, like at East Elementary. Um, and we will be working on that and keeping that um, into consideration because safety is part of this, um, the drive for this, um, the new buildings. Did you want to add? No, you're great. That's awesome. What is the plan if the levy fails? What is the plan? <laughs> the plan if the levy fails. fails. It's oh. not going to fail. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I mean, I, I'm not one to candy coat things. You can tell I'm pretty passionate about my work. Um, the fact of the matter is, is that today we aren't spending as much money on our facilities as what we need to. We know that. We know that we are behind on what we need to be investing back in our buildings, especially if they're going to be buildings that we are going to need to continue to use for years to come. Well, if we don't have a specific revenue source to address those issues, there's only one other place I have to take it from, and that's the operational budget. And so I would prefer not to think about what would happen if our community cannot support, uh, for one reason or another, uh, a specific stream of funds for uh, facilities because then you start to talk about what do you need to reduce in your day-to-day -day operations in order to be able to invest the literally millions of dollars that need to be invested into uh, school facilities. Just to, just to put this in context, because folks will often say to me, they'll say, oh, you have an $8 million carryover. 
Okay, I would, we have an $8 million carryover on a $35 million a year general fund operating budget, which may sound like a lot. But when you take into account, you know, figure, figure that out month by month, we're talking about $3 million a month, give or take. The difference is, is I don't get a paycheck every two weeks as a school district. I don't get a paycheck every month as a school district. As a school district, I get a paycheck in October when we get uh, personal property taxes from utilities, and we get paychecks when we get uh, property tax settlements, generally in April, and then if you, if, you know, we get secondary payments then later in the fall. Which means that $8 million cash that shows at the end of the year in any given month means that I may or may not be able to make payroll if I have three payrolls in one month. So while it looks like a big number, when you start to look at the detail of when those paychecks come in in the form of taxes and when we have expenses going out, if you start to get to the point where you have, and we just set our cash balance policy for this year at... Was it three? Three. It was still three? Three, three million dollars. So let's say you have five million dollars you're willing to risk and invest into facilities. How far is that $5 million going to go? And that's one-time money. That's not recurring money. That's the money you have in your savings account. So $5 million, you have HVAC systems at every building, you have roofs at every building, you have security systems at every building. Again, you're back to making those decisions about which one of our kids are going to get a better situation and which one of our kids are going to continue to have to go to school in subpar facilities. You add in the permanent improvement levy money, we collect about $1.3 million a year. By the time you take out what the county auditor uh, uh, takes for collections, uh, add even a million dollars a year to that, and you're literally talking about years and years and years into the future before you can address the, the challenges that we have with our facilities. For a 400 student elementary school in Yes, I've learned. For the for, for a for a four hundred elementary student in town, school in town, the OFCC recommends Baker. The current East State Street East State has two point six eight acres. How can you justify putting a school there? It's not. Yeah, I've got that. Uh, East Elementary has three acres, according to the, the school facilities. Is it the one I looked last school? Anyway. It's, it's not. It's, it's more than that. Um, so there are a couple systems in place. Um, we we apply for a waiver from the state. That's, that's one. Because we've heard very clearly that people in the community value having these schools in their neighborhoods. And so if we decided to not go with that and just meet the state standards, that means that really that you know, east east would not be east, west would not be there. Morrison would be kind of on the bubble that Morrison's only nine acres or eight or nine. Because what the what the state wants is to prevent school districts from being in the challenge issue that we're having right now. When you need to do major work on your buildings and you've only got four acres to do it, you don't have a lot of choices. And then you get sort of landlocked. So they want 20 something acres. So we can't do like Morrison Court or the high school, high school, 70 acres. You can take those, those buildings and you have some space, some flex space to move things. You also have more opportunities for students. But trying to balance what the state requires, what our, uh, what our area has to offer in terms of actual physical land, and what our, um, and what we, and what our community has, uh, has stressed as a value. That is what. Um, that's kind of where we would be at uh, with that. Yes, um, East has less space than the state. Re the state is requesting it. The state requires. But because we're already using that facility and that space, we can apply apply for a waiver. And for all intents and purposes, we're here from our architects. They have no um, no concern about that passing. Can we get something in here? They were right. It is. Is it 2.69? I'm looking at the, the the building assessments here. It says acreage at three. I would just like to point out that we have 400 students in that building today. If we wanted to deny open enrollment at that building, we would be, we could keep it at 400. So if you're uncomfortable with the 435, um, then you're uncomfortable with what we have today. 
and I'm not hearing many people in the community say that we're uncomfortable with what we have today. So to use a little bit of reverse logic, yeah, that's what the OFCC is saying they would prefer we have, uh, but they also understand that public schools that have urban environments, I know we're, we don't think ourselves urban, but city environments are going to have lots that are smaller than typical. The, one of the best examples are, if you go to Columbus much, German Village right on Schiller Park, uh, Stewart Avenue Elementary School has even less space than that, and, uh, and they did a, a renovation add to that building on a very small site. The state gave them a waiver to do it, and it is a beautiful school facility. Um, and so that's, that would be the justification I'd use is we have a building there of that size today, so we should be able to have a building there of that size for the next 100 years. According to the district's five-year capital budget plan, only 20% of the current uh, permanent improvement dollars pay for the building maintenance. If new buildings are funded, will the amount of money dedicated to preventive maintenance increase so we're not here in 30 years needing to rebuild again? Because you're talking about the, the, the village thing. Yeah, so, so that's in reference just to the permanent improvement levy. Um, I think it's important to keep in mind that the, the permanent improvement levy is, is only being allocated for large expenses. And permanent improvement levies under the state code can be used for the purchase of any what's considered uh, uh, permanent investment, which includes transportation. So every year we spend close to $200,000 a year of that one point, we'll say $1.2 million to replace two buses each year to make sure that we don't have old buses on the road. We invest a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in a contract with Johnson Controls to help us with the maintenance of our HVAC systems. We invest hundreds of thousands of dollars a year of that money into uh, technology. Uh, this year we invested $400,000, actually partly from general fund, uh, to replace the roof of the Chansey building. Last year we spent a couple hundred thousand dollars uh, on, on uh, replacing some of the, uh, the driveways parking areas which were in extreme need of repair at Athens High School and Athens Middle School. Um, it, it, it's, so so to, to ask the question, uh, if, if the bond issue passes, will we spend more money on, on, uh, on preventative maintenance? Uh, my argument would be is, is that you would, you would spend less on preventative maintenance at the front end, right? You have brand new systems, but that you would bank that money so that when you get to the point that your systems begin to need significant repair or replacement, you would have a fund of money to draw from in order to do that. The, the overwhelming majority of the money that we use for preventative maintenance today, which is our entire maintenance staff, our maintenance supervisor, uh, four full-time maintenance personnel, uh, uh, any of the contractors we have can come in and do work, that's actually part of our general fund expense and so it's not represented in that PI budget. And so you'd really need to, we'd have to tease out how many millions of dollars that is per year out of the general fund budget and add in the, uh, the PI fund money in order to do that. Um, I can tell you, and board members can tell you, I tend to be pretty fiscally conservative, so my push is gonna be, is if we're fortunate enough to get the support of the community on an issue of this nature, is to bank money into a PI fund. It's, it's always fun to spend money. But you need to put some away for a rainy day, and it's going to be my push to bank money into a PI fund so that when that day comes that these new facilities need uh, something replaced or repaired, we have, we have funds to draw from. If part of the goal of this plan is to help students interact more, combining school students, combining students in the same school, how will the district pay the training the teachers to accomplish this? That's good. Start. It's going to be you, right? Uh, do I have to answer everything? Well, it's about, it's about <laughs> teacher training, <laughs> professional development. We've already started. Uh, if, if you've been paying attention, we've adopted uh, new curricula in math, new curricula in uh, English language arts. Uh, we, have, we have reinvested and recommitted to using a responsive classroom program across the district, which is a program for elementary students to, uh, to assist teachers in helping with social emotional aspects of learning. Uh, we currently have a, a, a group working in regards to um, 
how do we, what training do our teachers need in regards to working with students from different ethnicities, races, uh, uh, socioeconomic status, disabilities, um, and that those we had a focus group a couple of weeks ago. We met with a parent group a couple of weeks ago. Uh, we are we are beginning that work because that work needs to happen regardless of what occurs with this with this with this bond issue. We need to make sure that our district is positioned to prepare our children for a world where they are going to, even if they stay in Athens, we're becoming more diverse by the day. And our students, our children need to be better prepared than we have been to enter into a world where they're going to have to interact with people who have different, have different world views, who have different religious beliefs, who have different philosophies, and the, the longer we try to shield them from that, it does, it does none of us any good. And so we've started to already invest in curriculum uh, that, that encourages more project-based learning, that encourages more interaction between students, that encourages more student-centered learning as opposed to the sage on the sage, what I'm doing to you right now. Uh, this is not how I want to see our classrooms operate. Our classrooms should operate where the students are the major participants in the learning and the teachers there is a resource for them and that is how you design classrooms that allow for students from a diverse backgrounds to interact with one another to learn from each other as well as with each other and we are well on our way to making those changes if the levy passes can the facilities plan change and put the single campus back on the it does stay the same as presented. It can, it cannot. Sorry. Well, technically. well like, technically, I mean, I guess we technically could. You could just. We voted for this. I hate to answer plan. another question. Right, I feel like I'm hogging the mic. All right. I'll, I'll, I'll apologize for being incorrect. Strictly legally, okay. until you sign a final agreement with the state of Ohio, um, that. And it's not official. Every document that comes from the state says draft on it. If you look on our website, every document on there says draft. However, I, I have never known of a Board of Education that would be so disingenuous as to change the plan after, after an election. Uh, the only instance I'm aware of in the state of Ohio that that's occurred is Switzerland of Ohio School District, which is one of the largest school districts in land area in the state of Ohio. And they were really into the small schools thing, got a special dispensation of the state to build multiple elementary schools that were much smaller than what the state would recommend. And after they passed their bond issue and started building, because there were so many buildings, they had to phase it out over multiple years, they continued to see decreases in student enrollment. And before they had the new buildings built, they had locations in the district that they literally could not populate students in the building. And so they changed their master plan to reduce the number of elementary buildings so that they were being responsible with taxpayer funds. So, but the strictly technical answer to the question is, is yes, you could change the plan. Uh, I have to be honest, I'd go down kicking, fighting, screaming, uh, because I just think that would be very disingenuous of the Board of Education to do that. Yeah, I mean, it seems crazy to do that. And that was taken off the table. And I've been on the board since January 1st, or whatever, I don't know. Yeah. We've not talked about the single candidate, one iota, in public or else, else it is not happening. And, and I mean, we listen. And we, we voted on this, and this is what we're putting forth for the, for the community to weigh in. There's no take backs, there's no tricks, no hidden agenda on here. Um, you know, we all, we all know each other. I mean, to, to say, hey, we're going to do this and totally switch would be, I, I don't know. Makes me. I guess. I guess if you technically can't, but it's not going to happen. It's just not. Sorry. I, I'm sorry. No, I mean, I didn't know. I started winding it up, but I'll see if I can get at least two more questions in. If the levy passes, can you guarantee that the overall academic performance of the district, as measured by the state report card, will improve? <laughs> State report cards. I think it's pretty sad to get a 32 page document telling you how to read the report card. Um, I personally don't have a lot of, um, put a lot of faith in the report card. I feel like 
our teachers are getting state-of-the-art training. Our students are getting quality education. Um, and I wholeheartedly believe that we are providing a solid education for each and every student. And we are making the right choices. That's my answer. I'll pass this on. And you know, there's a, there was an article that came out, I believe, today uh, from a Cleveland newspaper, which did some some looking in on, on what the state report, uh, report card data did and adjusted those numbers to reflect uh, levels of poverty within schools. And if we follow that, and I haven't looked at the methods yet, I just read it this morning, um, it puts us like at 41st in the state if adjusted for this, for our, our for poverty. Now, again, I'm just sharing that. I haven't dug into it yet, but that information's out there. But I, I could say, if kids, my kids go to Morse and Gordon, and if there is high CO2 levels in a building, uh, we know what CO2 does to sleepy, tired, it impacts their learning. If the kids need to be taking tests, uh, that are using technology to take tests, and the technology isn't functioning, they can't take the tests. So uh, if they don't have, we, there's a lot of studies that talk about how natural light impacts learning. There's, so it, it's when a teacher has to come into their classroom at, at the middle school, like they did last week, and start moving all of their equipment and all of their stuff that has gotten ruined by the rain, and it impacts their ability to prepare for teaching their students that day, yeah, that's going to impact the learning of kids. If they're in the gym at, like they were at East last week, um, and I was talking to Mr. Gonzi, he's just, he's like, did you like to lift the game and dodge the buckets? Because that's what the kids are doing in these spaces. So absolutely, when we improve our learning spaces, we are going to improve outcomes for kids. But it is not a one, there's nobody saying that this is going to blanketly make everything better. This is part of the entire educational experience for our kids. The spaces in which they learn and the spaces they live impact their lives. So do their teachers, so does curriculum, um, all of these, and their community, all of these things together are part of this web of education. And so nobody is here is saying that new buildings are going to solve all of our problems, but it's going to help. And if you get to some of these buildings, these facilities, a special education room, one of them at the high school, that is, it's just, I mean, it's crazy. Yes, it's, the kids are going to have better, better educational experiences in those, uh, in those spaces. For, for sure. And when you can't flush a toilet on the third floor or you have to go to a different floor in a building because that's not accessible because of your ability, then yes, that impacts your, the children's learning. And I, yes, I, 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 I cannot believe that learning in a room of water is dripping down or in a gymnasium or that the air quality is off is not impacting our children's learning. Uh, on to our next question. The state has requirements for what goes in the buildings the number of classrooms, etc. What are you prepared to do if the state's plan does not include sensory rooms or other things needed at Watson? Also, extra money. Sorry. Yeah, actually, the uh, the state does have they have they have kind of standard protocols, but you can you can adjust those protocols. So, for example, they have X number of square feet for gymnasium space. They have X number of square feet for even hallways and, and uh, community gathering areas. They, have, uh, they, they presume certain class sizes. So they presume in the, the plan that the, the class size is 25 students. Well, let's say that you uh, happen to have a district that prefers not to have 25 students in a class. You have, to have, say, 22. Well, you can take that square footage from those three students in each, every single classroom, add that together, and you can redesign other spaces in the building uh, in order to meet those needs. Um, the other thing, too, is that, that, interestingly, the OFCC's manual is based on kind of an antiquated view of special education where there are still designated spaces for different uh, identified uh, disability categories. And, and so they may view those in the manual. If you get online, you can view the manual. They may view those as like traditional MD learning spaces or ED learning spaces. Um, you can redesign those spaces. So if, you're, if you have a higher level of inclusion of identified students into a regular classroom setting uh, where you don't, you don't need as many of those specifically designated spaces, you're not as many pull-out spaces, you can then use that room to create a uh, to create a, a sensory room or another uh, specifically designed uh, area for a, a certain group of students. We also have um, additional LFI monies that we built in. For yeah, and, and, and the board did include uh, quite a significant uh, number of, of uh, locally funded initiative dollars uh, to adjust uh, as needed in regards to 
um, in regards to uh, adding square footage, different parts of the building. Um, you know, it, if you kind of, you always try to be conservative and plan for more of a worst case scenario, that interest rates are going to go up, that inflation is going to increase. Um, the, the, the more quickly that we can get a, a, a designated uh, revenue stream for facilities, uh, the more quickly we can get things under plan and, and start to start the process, in which case means that you may save money on interest rate, you may save money on inflation, and all of those dollars can be put back into the project to upgrade and improve uh, the, the facility that you do design. This will be the next question. How do you know the state money will be there? And if it's not, what do you think? So I, per I personally call the OCC and I asked them that question. Because, and this was because we were told that doesn't happen. But I called myself and talked to somebody there and they said that has never happened. The school that has passed. It's levy, the school district that has passed its levy and submitted a master plan to the state of Ohio, every single one has been funded. And I've, I've heard around the community a, a legitimate concern that people said, my number one concern about this is that we might not get our state money. We, that, that this is not how it works. Um, it's, if we're comparing it to what happened at the middle school with the, um, that, the, uh, L, um, ELP program, that's a different program, it's a different system, it's not what we're going through with this. And, and that money is not gone, we just, you know, it's just, the credit is now. yeah, the credit is now. So, um, there, there's one school district in the state of Ohio that's kind of fighting with OFCC, but their plan was so large, and they wanted to do so many extra things, and it was going to cost the OFCC an extraordinary amount of money, that they're kind of going back and forth a little bit about well, what they're, you know, what they're going to actually pay on, that's not the case with us. We're not even close to that. So um, if we take past history into account and, and the way that this process works, that um, that money will come to us. And Dr. Gibson, legally correct in that? Probably not. To the best of my knowledge today. To the best of his knowledge today. Anybody else? Okay, thank you very much. You each have one minute to present First of all, thank you all for coming. It's great to see the community um, here and asking such um, great questions to, to dive into this. The two things that um, were important to me when addressing these facilities was the safety of our buildings. Um, I feel very strong that we need to enter our buildings in a secure office where they, our students, um, somebody enters and there is glass doors and they go through and they are checked in with um, staff. The other thing that was not brought up once is the kitchens. We, do, we have warm-up kitchens in our buildings. All of the new facilities come with kitchens that are state-of-the-art so that we can actually prepare food in each of our facilities for our students to eat. And I think that is an important thing. We have so many children on free and reduced lunch, and if we can continue to provide them excellent food um, that they will want to eat, that will only improve their educational. But thank you for coming. Thank you to the League of Women Voters for your continued vigilance. Democratic process. Thank you for all participating uh, and being involved in what's going on in education in uh, the Athens City School District, which incorporates Chansey and Millfield and, and the Plains and in Athens. It's very broad. Um, this process has been going on for a long time, and um, and it has been an exhaustive process. This is not just kind of a fly-by-night arrival point. This, I mean, this has been going on. If you can take it back to Ben, take it back all the way to the middle school. Um, there are built, all the building assessments are online, there's almost 500 pages of them and they have been gone through. Experts from the state of Ohio, uh, multiple, uh, multiple experts in building and construction. And so we're, we are, um, we are at this place where we need to make a decision about what is going to happen with the facilities in our district. And we hope that uh, this is just a little bit of, uh, the ability to be a little bit informed about what this is and, and to 
uh, and what, the, what this isn't. And I'm going to give the microphone to Dr. Gibbs. Did you get a new haircut today? I did not. I did. I did. <laughs> and I compliment my haircut. I've always complimented you, but you did not compliment her today. Just a little hard. I haven't had time to get a haircut. I noticed they didn't give me the mic to comment on the local report card, but you can read what I felt about that in the Sunday paper. Um, I, I know a lot of people in the room, but a lot of people in the room don't, don't know much about me. Um, neither of my parents graduated from high school. I grew up very poor. Um, we moved a lot. Um, but I am here today having earned three college degrees uh, earning a, a good living for my family, providing a different life for my daughter, because there were adults in my life who cared. And they cared by supporting public schools, they cared by being excellent school teachers, uh, they cared by coming together as communities in the different communities that I lived in to provide a high quality education for the children who lived there. And the only thing that I can ask of anyone in this community is, you need to vote your heart, you need to vote what you believe in. But I would just like to, to continue to reiterate, we are a community that supports public education, we are a community where education is important to us, and we need to continue to demonstrate that commitment to our kids. Um, and uh, that's, you know, I'm, like I said, I'm very passionate about my work because my work represents what other people did for me growing up, and I hope that all of us in this room, all of us in the school district, can continue to be uh, those people for the children in our lives. So thank you for being here tonight. And thank you, regardless of how you vote on this issue, thank you for supporting the Athens City School District.